This will be all going as planned. We will be finishing up today our discussion of crossbreeding systems. And then starting on Friday, Dr. Peterson will step back in and talk about some of the really cool modern technologies that are now becoming part of our toolkit in what we do in animal breeding and genetics. So we'll finish off the course focusing in on some of these uh, new modern tools. Okay? So, a couple announcements, pretty important. Um, homework number three is due on Friday. We posted a note about this, but I want to re-emphasize it. We unintentionally made three be a little tougher than we had wished. So we posted a note about that, and we also reposted that homework assignment. It only affected 3B, but if you look at that, you will find the problem a little bit easier. If you want to do it the other way, that's okay, but I guarantee there's going to be a fair bit more effort. So we got a little carried away and we didn't quite realize it. So please take a look at that and answer it with the instructions for 3B. We basically just pulled out part of the problem so it wasn't quite as comprehensive. Okay, so take a look at that. Cyber Sheep team evaluations, they are also due on Friday. Your final quiz, also on Friday, okay? So that will effectively finish up the formal in-class assessment. The only thing remaining will be the final exam. What we will do, because it gets a little bit complicated to figure out yourselves, is because we dropped two labs, your current score on Canvas must be wrong, because it doesn't do that for us. So once we get everything in, early part of next week, we will go and post what your true points are to date. And then you'll know exactly what you would need to do on the final to achieve a certain grade, because we have a system that we guarantee you will receive grades if you hit certain points. So once we get everything in, get those all graded early next week, we will then go ahead and tell you exactly where you are accounting for dropping your two lowest labs. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, just want everyone to be clear. All right. So, with that, last time I uh, talked about the set of a half a dozen or so criteria for crossbreeding systems, and this is what they are. Breed effects, hybrid vigor, complementarity, how consistent the performance of the offspring from that system are. Replacement considerations, a really big deal, really big deal in the design of crossbreeding programs. And are they simple enough that we can actually do them without too much angst? That too is really important when we think about their design, okay? And what I'm gonna do in a moment is use these as a way to curtail or evaluate the kinds of crossbreeding systems that are the norm. Okay, so we'll put it in that context. And then I did introduce one system, a spatial rotational crossbreeding system, and I'm gonna review what that is as we get started. Okay, so this is what a spatial system looked like. This was involving three breeds. I also showed you an example with two breeds. So that's what it looked like where we'd have these three different herds or flocks, we would breed females that were largely breed B, breed A, excuse me, back to breed B sires. We would breed females that are largely breed B back to breed C sires and so forth. And then in this system, all males are sold and females then rotate around to the next herd. Because we breed those females to breed B sires, their progeny are primarily breed B, so those breed B replacements flow down to the next herd, and so forth and so on, okay? Notice something that's really important. Each of these groups, as we look at where they are at equilibrium, have different proportions of the three breeds, right? They're not consistent across the three systems. So this one has four sevenths A, this one down here has four sevenths B, this one up here has four sevenths C. So that impacts how consistent those progeny are across the entire system because they're varying 
in the proportions of the three breeds in them. So one of our criteria was consistency. That isn't very consistent, right? It's one of the weaknesses of this kind of system. And one of the things that we did right at the end is I asked you to figure out what the retained hybrid vigor was as an illustration. Many of you thought it was closer to 71% rather than 86%, which worried me just a little bit. And so I wanted to take just a step back to be sure we were all on the same page on these calculations, because they're pretty important when we think about is our system working or not. So in the illustration, we were looking at uh, this part of the rotational system. We took breed B sires and we bred them back to females that were four sevens breed A, one sevens breed B, and two sevens breed C. So to help me, because most of you thought it was 71%, so I can provide a little bit more insight. Anyone willing to kind of tell me what their thinking was so we can clear it up, because that was a, a common conception. Anyone willing to tell me what they were thinking? It was a guess, that's perhaps one way. So we want to move away from that. That was honest and sincere. So we don't want it to be a guess. We should be able to figure it out. Anything else? Yes. So when you have the example on the other side of the board, okay. um, with the Andrea, 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 with if you think about that composite, was the proportion of each of the breeds equal? It was all over the board, right? So it leaned more towards one breed type than another breed type. When that's the case, whatever that main breed type is, depending on who you made it to, it's going to have a huge impact on how much heterozygosity is left over. Typically, and we'll see an illustration of that, Typically, when we talk about what's the advantage of two versus four versus eight, the presumption is they're in equal proportions in that composite. When that's the case, it's absolutely so that as you have more breeds, the retained hybrid figure will go up. That's very good to notice. But the reason for the distinction there was it wasn't in equal proportions in that composite. Does that make sense? It's a great question. <coughs> So it isn't only that they have lots of breeds, it's the proportion of those breeds contributing to the composite that matters when you cross them. Okay? So let's take a look over here because I want to make sure we're all on the same page. This is the equation for re percent retained hybrid vigor that Dr. Peterson introduced. And basically it was one minus the sum of the circumstances where the sire breed and the dam breed come together in that cross. So in this illustration, we've got pure breed B. Everybody happy with that? Right? We had four sevens breed A, one seventh breed B, two sevens breed C. Right? So if we fill out that summation that Dr. Peterson introduced, there was no breed A in the sire, right? So that's where the zero is coming from. Four sevens breed A in the dam all breed B in the sire, that's all it was. One sevenths of breed B in the dam, no breed C in the sire, two sevenths of breed B, of breed C, excuse me, in the dam, right? So we would sum those things up. Turns out that's only one seventh because that's a zero and that's a zero. We subtract that from one, multiply by 100, we come up with the 86%. You can do this a lot easier if you just look at the problem, right? What can you do? If there's none of that breed in there, does it have any possibility of losing hybrid vigor? If there's none of a breed in one or the others, is there any way you can lose hybrid vigor due to that breed combining? You can't, right? So really, anytime a breed here doesn't show up over there, it has no impact, right? So we could just say, ah, oh, forget that. I don't even want to write that down. And forget that. And so it really just 
boils down to recognizing the only place in that cross where we're losing hybrid vigor is when the sire and the dam breed are the same. Where it's not, it has no consequence, so we can just ignore that. Does that make sense? So you can save yourself some writing just by looking at the sire and dam breed, recognizing where they overlap and when they do not. Okay? I guarantee you're going to see this again, so if you have questions, please take a look. You'll have opportunity to uh, practice in labs, but I want you to be comfortable with it. Questions, please. If there's anything. No? Okay. All right. So that's a little bit of review of where we left off. And so let's now talk about, it's going to work, yep, where we're going to go to today. We're going to continue talking about rotational crossbreeding systems. I want to put them in the context of our criteria, move on to specific or terminal sire crossbreeding systems. These are the ones I actually work with a lot more, so I just kind of like them. I'll maybe show that bias as I talk about them. And then we'll finish up with a couple comments about composite breeds. Time allows, I have one more example at the end. So that's what we're gonna do today. Okay, all right. So, we were talking about spatial rotations. That's the example that we just worked through. Let's take a look at the criteria that's associated with it, okay? Hybrid vigor. Well, we just figured out a moment ago that with a three breed rotational system, we held on to 86% of the hybrid vigor, right? Not bad, okay, not bad. And so typically we do retain reasonable amounts of hybrid vigor with these rotational system. Going back to an earlier question, if we did this with four breeds rather than three breeds, do you think we'd hold on to more hybrid vigor? Probably so, right? Does it make it a lot more complicated? Then you need a whole fourth herd, you need that purebred from somewhere, right? So this is the balance, right? That's the balance point, okay? Can't use much breed complementarity because we have these crosses of one breed to the sire breed that's least like the dam breed. That's how we make that decision. And so we're not really able to say, oh, we have the ideal female and the ideal male because we have to kind of rotate them through. So we have to live with that. So we lose opportunity to, to control very well our choice of the dam and the sire breed. Consistency can become a problem because of the fact that we are mating different kinds of females and males together. A way to avoid that is if all of the ancestral breeds are similar biologically, but to be honest, when I design a crossbreeding system, it's usually not that I want it to be similar, right? I want to take care of characteristics that are strong on the female side, strong on the, on the paternal or the male side, and mix them together. So I don't typically have inherently similar ancestral breed types when I create these crosses. So it would do it, it would make it more consistent. Not sure it's always pragmatic. Does that make sense conceptually? All right. I'm trying to take advantage of their difference in the design of my breeding program or my crossbreeding program. So they probably aren't gonna be ancestrally all that similar. Replacement, that's what's brilliant about these schemes. You get your females right out of it, they rotate to the next herd or flock, you're good to go. So it's a very easy way to produce replacements for a crossbreeding program. That is without doubt their greatest benefit. That is without doubt their greatest benefit. Simplicity, well it depends on how many breeds. If you have two breeds, pretty straightforward. Three breeds, gets a little bit more complicated. If you get four or five, it gets to be pretty much a mess to try to keep it all straight. All you need is a fence to get knocked down and you're done for, okay? So it gets more complicated as you have more breeds. But by having more breeds, you do retain more of that hybrid vigor. That's the trade-off. Okay. So spatial rotations, any questions on those? No? Okay. So specific or terminal sire, this is the other approach. It has a different focus, a different priority. It's a crossbreeding system where the maternal breed females are mated to paternal breed males. And by that I mean we have female sides of our cross that are excellent in female attributes. They're fertile, high conception rates. If they're a litter-bearing species, they have the right litter size, they're good moms. So everything that makes a, 
uh, the reproductive fitness of your system better, that's what you're going to try to pick up through your maternal breed. And then what you do is you breed those maternal females to a paternal breed that excels in all of the growth and carcass attributes. So you're trying to take advantage of good maternal attributes on the female side and good growth carcass attributes on the male side. So that's the design. Okay. Uh, really well suited for the marketplace. You'll see in a moment that all of the progeny, if it's well designed, are exactly the same in terms of their breed composition. Really helps your consistency in the product. So this is really well designed to produce animals. The final cross, all are sold, so you're really looking to an, uh, a market output, um, and therefore you can really focus on combining the breeds to produce the ideal crossbred to meet a food requirement. Okay. So let's look at some examples to hopefully hone in on that. Okay. This three breed specific cross is sort of the historic start of these systems. Okay. So this is how they all kind of kicked off. And what they involved is you produce an F1 female. So that would be a cross of two breeds to create an F1 female that has good maternal attributes. And then you breed it to a terminal sire, a good paternal sire, to produce a crossbred progeny. All of those go to market. Okay? So typically you produce a good maternal by a two-way cross, and you breed that back to a paternal sire. So this is really the start off, to be honest, historically of these systems. We're actually uh, in Europe, in the United Kingdom particularly, where they have a, a landscape that looks like this. You got hills up here where often you might as well be swimming rather than trying to walk. There's a lot of rain, okay, pretty heavy weather, unimproved pastures. There's what we call upland areas which are moderately improved, but they still don't have a lot of change in pasture quality. And then you get to the lowlands which are tending to be improved pasture. So you're moving from a harsher, poorer quality uh, environment down to a much more um, amiable, much higher quality nutrition. And the system is built because of that. So you start on the top with these what are called hill use. These are uh, Scottish black faces. They tend to be moderate size, very hardy. It's remarkable how well those animals go on. One of the real cool attributes of some of these breeds is something called hefting. If you pull these animals in to work them and you let them go back out, they go back to the same spot of the hill every time. And you see these families forming. Some of the original behavioral work was done looking at these hefting behaviors. It's really interesting. If you look at family similarities within the hefts, they tend to be pretty closely related because they train one another, if I may, to go back and graze the same area. So it's kind of a cool behavioral attributes. But anyhow, these are pretty hardy, uh, moderate sized animals. They're bred to what is called a crossing sire. That's a blue-faced lester. They tend to be larger in mature size. You want to get a larger female to breed. Really prolific actually too prolific to be used as a pure, but when you create these crossbreds between a hill and a crossing sire breed, those ewes are about the right size and they'll bring two lambs home. And that's what I mentioned is key to the profitability of sheep units. So they're big enough and they produce two lambs almost every time. Okay, so then what you do with those critters is you breed them to a terminal sire. The Texel is the dominant terminal sire breed in most of Europe. And you then end up producing a crossbred lamb. You get two of them. They grow really well. They have good carcass attributes. All those critters go to the market. Okay, so that's the classic three-way terminal system. Okay, so you produce an ideal female through the F1 breed them back to a terminal to produce your final market crop. And nearly all lamb that goes into the slaughter facilities in much of Europe are kind of like this. Some variation in what breeds are used, but that's the structure. And it works really well. Okay. So let's kind of map that out uh, just so you see it as a diagram. Here's the black face being bred to, sorry, the blue face Lester being bred to the Scottish black face. They cre create this F1, it's half a Scottish black face, half blue face Lester. What you then do is market all the males. There's a little bit of a loss in the system there because those carcasses aren't ideal. Okay, so you do have a cost. They're pretty good, but you get a bit of a, 
knockback because of the quality of that male lamb. But then you breed those to your meat sheep, in this case the Texel, you produce that cross. Any loss in heterozygosity going on anywhere in this system? <coughs> Any loss in heterozygosity? Not at all, right? Always crossing different breeds together. These are all one half Texel, one half blue face Lester, one half Scottish blackface. They're very uniform in their breed makeup, right? They're all the same. And basically all the males and females are marketed. Really good system, okay? So that's one illustration. Let's look at another one. Here's a one that's really used commonly in the pig industry, which is very vertically integrated. As I explain this example, think about if you were the manager of a large-scale purebred pig breeding program, why does this work so well to your advantage? Keep this in mind, okay? Because this is how they design the system, and it has uh, a, a real purpose to it in terms of how they um, define their business, if I may. So let's look at it. We've got two maternal breeds, the Yorkshire and the Landris. Uh, paternal breeds are the Durick and the Hamp. So this is what you do. You cross those pairs, okay? And you produce F1s, half Dork, half, sorry, half Duroc, half Hampshire, and half Yorkshire, and half Landrace. Which of these are the maternal side of this cross? Over here, right? So here we're trying to get the attributes of both of those breeds for the maternal, doing the same on the paternal, okay? Basically, on the uh, male side, most males and all females are marketed, right? We just need enough boars kept back to breed back to the females that we're retaining in the York Landrace cross. All males go there, and then we breed the male to the female, and we end up with this four-way cross of those breeds, okay? Why is that ideal? Please, question? Um. <clears throat> So like in a system like this, are they going to have to keep purchasing like the purebreds to keep their stock like so, for replacements? So you're a, you're a commercial producer. Where are you getting your, your purebreds, your animals from? Like breeding stock? Your breeding, where, where are they coming from? Well, like give me cow calves for, um, or maybe cow calves for cattle, but I don't know about pigs and sheep. So what's happening, it's this idea that that Brittany is raising, is companies are investing a lot of cash in developing unique purebred lines, right? Do they sell those purebreds to their commercial customers? Do they let that genetic material off their farms? Would you? You want to be the most competitive PIC in the world, are you going to let your purebred lines off for somebody else to try to duplicate? Nope. So they cross them. Do you let these go? You let the F1s? Seems like you might, but typically they don't. Typically what's going out to their commercial operations um, are going to be, you know, particularly if they're, if, if they're feeders, they're getting these critters out, okay? That's how they're finishing their pigs. And they're put, keeping pretty control, strong control even of those lines because you can regenerate it. Yep? Well, I, I meant like the replacements for like the the very first generation, not the F1, but the... These here? Those are, coming the, those are coming from the main pig operations. So they'll have those so four... Then, go ahead. They have to buy them. Yes, they got to, somebody's got to buy them as they move down the system. Or they have a contract where they're made available through a variety of different entities. Okay. okay? But they're certainly not letting these crossbred, these purebreds out. They have some control on these. Ultimately, that's the final product they want available commercially, right? Okay. So, please. Do those calves have a higher premium to offset the cost of buying those pure red cows? I mean, the work is good. So, do. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, I mean, if somebody's going to buy into this system, they need to be guaranteed they're going to get their returns from it. And it's one of the challenges, and we'll talk about it a little bit more, of these terminal programs is where those females come from. So do you raise them yourself? And the commercial companies would be kind of vertically integrating all of this part of their system. They're not going to let much of that go out to a, 
uh, a commercial user that isn't part of that vertical integration. So the costings need to be built in to, to, to move those replacements around. In a beef cattle operation, it gets more complicated. So if you want to buy in a two-way cross, you got to pay money from somebody to get a hold of them. And that's a cost that you need to consider. It's a good point. Okay. And all of those are marketed. They tend to be really uniform because they're clearly a four-way cross, right? And so they are all have the same breed composition as one another, so it helps with consistency. So if we think about the criteria, okay, typically we're able to maintain all of our hybrid vigor because everything has separate breeds being crossed to create that animal. Breed complementarity can be really effective. You're choosing sire breeds and dam breeds to produce particular components of your system. So it's a very effective opportunity to use the, the, the dam versus the sire breed complementarity. Consistency, you know, when you're mating back to this terminal sire, the genetic composition of all of the progeny are the same, and so you tend to produce a very consistent product. All big pluses, right? All good things for this program. When you move to replacements, that's where it gets a little bit more, bit more sticky. Where do they come from? Okay. Either you need to raise them, which means you need purebreds and crosses and so forth. Really works well for large vertically integrated systems. A little bit harder in our beef cattle industry, okay, at times, right? Uh, but you need to re raise or purchase them. Simplicity, well, if you buy them, it's pretty simple. You just have them enough money to pay for it. If you raise them yourselves, it becomes a lot more complicated. Because then you need to think about all of the components of that system to create the various crosses to get you down to that final three or four way cross that you're trying to produce. Okay? Questions about that? That makes sense? Pretty cool system, but it has some constraints, just like a rotational system. So let's look at them comparatively. Okay? So here's our specific where you're either buying or raising your replacements. Here's that spatial that we looked at yesterday and reviewed a little bit. So let's look at the benefits things I've circled in blue, okay? So if we take a look at the specific, they're good in hybrid vigor, complementarity, and consistency. And if you're buying replacements, pretty easy. Why do you think I have two pluses there and only one plus there? If you're not buying your replacements, what are you gonna have to do? If you're not willing to buy them, came up a moment ago. You got to raise them. So if you're going to raise them, what do you have to have running around along with these crosses? Purebred parents, right? If you have purebred parents, are you taking account of complementarity when maintaining those purebreds? Not really, you're breeding like to like, right? So you're not able to choose a female and male side to your advantage because you're keeping them as pures, okay? And so you're losing complementarity, okay? If you're raising your own. Equally, you're not getting hybrid vigor when you're breeding like to like. There's just a purebred. So you lose hybrid vigor in the overall system. So the real change as you move from buy to raise is here you need to have that additional resource to breed replacements, which typically means you need to have purebreds or particular crosses that you then cross again to create what you want. Okay? One of the reasons that composites have become so popular in beef cattle, okay? you move away from some of those complications on replacements. All right. If we take a look at the spatial, Maintain a fair bit of hybrid vigor, as we saw over here, depending on how many breeds. Beauty of them is replacements. They come directly out of the system. No hassle factor there at all. A real strength. Um, and so if we look at the uh, limits, well, with the spatial, we lose complementarity and consistency because we have these different sire and dam breeds that we're trying to rotate around to create uh, our replacements and our market animals. So we lose consistency. We have really no control of complementarity because we ultimately have breeds of different makeup that we're going to be breeding back and forth and we have to live with it. But the real advantage, great on replacements versus that's the constraint of these uh, 
terminal or specific crossbreeding systems. I.e., the world is not perfect, right? We have to make the best of it for our own programs. And you need to think about that when you design. These are the considerations you want to go through. Okay. All right. You can modify these systems. Um, for example, you can combine com components of both if you wish to do so. Pretty common people bring a crossbred in to part of that system, particularly on the male side. If they want to use a particular terminal sire that may have a couple of attributes, you might get a crossbred male that you bring back to a, a maternal breed female to create the kind that you want. So they're not hard and fast, you can modify them. And by doing so, you can mess around with these criteria. So, questions on this. This is the general framework behind all crossbreeding systems. You're balancing these criteria. You know what you're giving up, you know what you're gaining, and you're thinking about the economics has been raised in terms of how you keep these systems going on. Okay, everybody good? Okay. So let's move on lastly to composites. We spoke a little bit about those, uh, so you have a sense. So I'll be fairly quick, but I wanna put them in the context of these criteria. So a composite is a hybrid with at least two, typically more animals in its background. And they basically are, once you create the composite, you deal with them like they're a purebred. So you create your composite, and then you intersay or intermate the composite back to itself. So once you get that created, off you go, just like you would with a pure breeding program. So let's take a look at some examples. The Brangus, 5 8 Angus, 3 8 Brahmin. So that began, oh, I think in about the 1930s between the two big wars. Uh, actually, a lot of that work on developing the Brangus, actually looking at the Brahmin and the Angus in combination was done in Louisiana by the USDA. And then there are a lot of other producers that got engaged. I think the Brangus Association formalized in about 1950, 1949. So it's been around for a while. So appreciate that. The idea of composites isn't new, right? And the reason they came about is in that environment, in Louisiana, having the hardiness, disease resistant of the Brahmin complemented with some of the other uh, early maturing carcass characteristics of the Angus really fitted that system. Okay? Notice USDA has had a huge impact in development of composites in the US. You'll see another example of that in a moment. Okay? But, so they've been around for a while, so that's one example. Here's probably one of the most popular composite on the sheep side. It's called a poly pay. The poly comes from the view that this breed was created to allow them to lamb more than once a year. It's one of the real constraints in sheep operations. And this is actually developed at the U.S. Sheep Experiment Station in Du Bois, Idaho back in, gosh, early 1960s by a guy with the name of Hullett, who was one of the scientists there. And he said, we don't have productive enough sheep, so what are we gonna do about it? And what he wanted to do is create an animal that was adapted, but could lamb twice a year and produce some wool. And so what he did in his cleverness is he did a four breed composite, finished fin sheep, I showed you a picture of them, really highly prolific, right, lots of lambs. Rambouillet, good wool breed, the Targi, it itself is a composite as well, but it leans towards larger mature size and wool characteristic, and the dorset, which is really good for, historically, for out of season lambing, and good maternal and growth attributes. So basically this polypay was one quarter of each of those breeds. And so the goal, the reason it was created, is he wanted a sheep that would bring two lambs home, perhaps <coughs> lamb more than once a year, and gave you some wool. And felt they could do it, he felt, and I think it's true, that perhaps that could be done by combining breeds into a composite. Okay. Very clear goals before you get after thinking about a composite breed. Okay. All right. So let's think about the criteria. Uh, hybrid vigor. Well, the amount retained depends on the number of breeds in the composite. Question about this came up a little while ago. So when I'm talking about an eight breed composite here, the presumption is you have one eighth of each breed in that composite. Okay. That's the general ballpark. So notice as you go from the two breed, unsurprisingly, I hope, you see only 50% of the hybrid vigor is retained when you'd cross a composite, which was a two-way cross, one half versus 
The other half, Dr. Peterson spoke a lot about that on retained hybrid vigor from that kind of a cross. When you add a third, uh, two more breeds in, you get 75%. Eight breeds, you get 88%. Look over here as a reminder, right? That was a three breed cross, right? But we were still maintaining 86% of the hybrid vigor. That was coming about because every time you're breeding a purebred sire back into a dam that only had one seventh of it in her, right? That's less than would otherwise be for a four way cross, okay? And so that's why that hybrid vigor is being retained. So these are the modifications on these systems to mess around with hybrid vigor and the other attributes. Um, as you inter se mate these composites, they become very much like a purebred and they suffer the same risks of inbreeding. Uh, breed complementarity in the composite itself, it's like a purebred, you gotta live with what it is, but you can use complementarity as you develop that composite. You can take advantage of that. Consistency, similar to a purebred after they're established, so it's very much like a pure breeding system once it's up and going. Replacement consideration, brilliant. Replacements come right out. You're breeding the males and females from that composite to each other, producing female replacements, keeping them back for your system. So it's really handy in terms of replacements. Simplicity, once you get the composite form, pretty straightforward because you can have a single herd or flock, but depending on how complicated it is in creating the composite, think about our Australian example. There's a lot of work there. It can be hard to create. But once you get there and you're happy with it, you're good to go and it's like any other pure breeding system. Okay. But there are some extra criteria that I like about composites. That's why I'm pretty keen on them. You can design them to fit your system. We're going back to the very start of the course, right? You need to think about your production system. And if I don't have a purebred that does it for me, why not create a genotype that fits my system? That's what composites do. But what it means is you really need to think about what your conditions are. Are you in a desert? Are you in the tropics? Are you in cold climates? This is at Alexandra a breed in Australia. You know, you need to think a lot about where you're going to produce your animals. But if you can do that and then rationalize what breeds to put into the composite, you can do a really brilliant job of tailoring that critter to your production system. It's one of the beauties of developing a composite breed. Okay? Uh, and it's really important when you're in harsh environments because there are very few breeds on their own that are ideal to meet all of the conditions of those kinds of environments. You can often do better by combining breeds to create something that really does fit. Okay? So, uh, choosing the breeds and in what proportion becomes really important. You need to think about the economics. You know, if I'm producing an animal that I want to get grown in a feedlot at a certain age to hit a certain target point, you know, how much of some of the Bostonicus breed do I want in it? How do I balance that out? So what do I do to get disease resistance and hardiness when I'm trying to produce an animal that I'm trying to finish to a certain hot weight and level of fatness at a certain point in time? So you need to think about the proportions. Um, how will it be used? Is it a general purpose or maternal breed? The illustration I showed from industry, they had a terminal sire and a maternal composite that they then crossed in order to produce that final calf. Okay, so you need to think about what you're planning to use a composite for and uh, where is it gonna be? What is your environmental niche? Are you in Australia? Are you down in the south in Louisiana? Are you up here in Sand Hills of Nebraska? Are you up in Canada or out on an island somewhere off the coast of, uh, of Scotland? Okay, it all matters. It all matters, okay? So, these are critical steps when you think about forming a composite. As I have harped on, we don't spend enough time, in my view, in designing breeding programs thinking about all of these bits that define what our best animal is. I think it's well worth investing more effort in that. Okay. So, how we get them started? Well, it makes sense that you choose the best of the purebreds when you create your composite, right? Why start with mediocre animals? 
This is the comment that I made, should pure breeders worry about crossbreeding? My claim is yes, because they feed the animals in that someone would use to create a composite or any other crossbred. Why not start with better genetic merit animals and take advantage of that, right? So it does matter, you want to choose good founders. To maintain hybrid vigor, you need to make sure that you uh, find unrelated males and females. This is often a shortcoming when we're bringing in exotics. Think about what we've done in many countries, including ours. There's not a lot of individual animals that have come in to really establish a breed. And you've already seen the consequence of inbreeding when you don't have large operations. So you need to think about trying to make sure your starting point is as diverse as it can be because you want to avoid inbreeding. You don't want related males and females. And think really big. You know, if I was to kick this kind of system off, I want to start with as many animals as I can afford so that I create a composite that is pretty broad in terms of genetic diversity. But one of the beauties about a composite is you always have a way out. If it turns out that they become too inbred, you can go back and recreate the composite from scratch and start again. And there's lots of examples where that's happened, where somebody says, ah, I'm struggling with inbreeding. I don't have anyone to buy from because they don't create my composite. So I'm going to go back, recreate it again, and then integrate that into my system. So you do have a little bit of an out on inbreeding with a composite. Okay. Pretty cool systems. All right. So, one more example to finish off this discussion, okay? This to give you a little more practice, so you're gonna wanna work with your buddy on this when we do it, okay? What I want you to consider is we're gonna go back to our Australian example where they created a terminal sire composite, which is this Kanuna bull, it's 1 8 Brahmin, 3 8 Shorthorn, 2 8 Red Angus, and 2 8 Thule. As a reminder, the Thule is an adapted boss Taurus breed that came originally out of Zimbabwe. Okay, So that's what they call their terminal sire. And then they breed them to their Alexandria cows, which are 616 Brahma, 216 Afrikaner, Afrikander, excuse me, 516 Shorthorn, 216 Char Charlay, and 116 Hereford. To help you think through this, which of those breeds matter when we think about hybrid vigor in their crossbred progeny? Brahmin, does that matter? Why? One eighth here, six eighths there, right? Shorthorn, does it matter? Does? Three eighths here, three eighths down here. Red Angus, does it matter? Doesn't matter, right? Not on the female side. Thule, does it matter? Nope. So really the loss in heterozygosity here is only because, right, we've got the Brahmin coming together in the male and the female, right? And the Shorthorn coming together in the male and the female. Nothing else matters, right? So it makes life a lot easier when we do our calculations, okay? So what I want you to do, and do that with your partner or whomever you're sitting adjacent to, I want you to go back, calculate retain hybrid vigor associated with those crosses. And then I do have some examples to pick out as part of a, a clicker exercise, but I don't want to show you those yet. I want you to do the calculation first. So what would be the retain hybrid vigor in the cross of those two composite breeds.
Everybody about there? Folks good? Yes? Yep, okay. So this is what I propose as potential answers. So take a look at that. And I will start this up and put in your in your choice. Still entering? Everybody logged in? All right, let's see what we got. So what C was 83.6%. Well done team, all right? So let's do this real quick and we'll finish up. So, right, on this board to make my life easier, what can I cross off? What can I cross off? I'm gonna look at retain hybrid vigor. What can I cross off? They're gone. T can go, right? AR down here. Yep, what else? So really what I'm thinking about with my retained hybrid vigor I'm going to change to red here and that's not working. Can you see this red? I know that's been a problem. Up in the back? Yep, okay. So this is gonna be one minus. I've gotta take my one eighth Brahmin here, my six sixteenth Brahmin there. Gotta pick up my three eighths short horn and my five sixteenths. Multiply that by 100, and if you go through that calculation, you're going to end up with 86.3%. So to finish up, stay with me here. Take a look at the purebred, take a look at the purebred female side of the cross. What was she at? She was at 86%, right? If you actually went through, and it might be worthwhile doing, because one of these other answers would be the hybrid vigor if you inter se mated the terminal sire breed. So if you mated this to back to itself, which they have to do to maintain that composite, right? Have to do that. It turns out that this one's has greater loss of hybrid vigor than we're seeing over here on the female side, okay? Be worth doing that just to see that it all makes sense, okay? But we're retaining in this final cross most of the hybrid vigor, almost as much as that eight breed cross, right? That we saw a moment ago. So it's a very effective system these folks have come up with commercially, and I'll finish there and we'll see it lab.